also in the Time magazine and Newsweek and the Time London, so he actually really uh, extended his work. And he published books, and he also has an uh, iPad app, so uh, he's pretty productive. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so um, I think the main uh, common interest that we have uh, with caricaturists is that we want to understand how we uh, represent the identity of people, and I think what we try to study scientifically, they actually know inherently in their mind, and I ask Hanok to try to convey us his uh, intuition <laughs> about it. All right? right. Thanks so much. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's, uh, it's exciting. And um, what I can tell you is that um, I'm not going to show you any charts. I don't have any statistics. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no idea what I'm doing. There is no, I, I have no theory. It's all intuition and uh, an experience. And, um, and, and as a matter of fact, I think uh, the ability to, um, to get likenesses is obviously, obviously an intuitive uh, Thank Sorry. you, thank you. An intuitive ability. And uh, interestingly enough, it's a different talent than knowing how to draw. You can draw very well, but you're not going to get a good likeness, and quite the opposite. I myself, I'm not a great draftman. I don't draw very well. I draw OK, uh, probably better than the average people. But um, I'm the worst uh, caricature, I'm the worst, dra the worst draft draftman amongst caricaturists. Um, but I'm good at getting likenesses. So those are two different um, uh, face, um, talents. So um, I thought I was going to start uh, um, saying goodbye to this guy today. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it, uh, it just didn't, uh, didn't happen. And, um, and um, Galit was talking about my days in Aretz uh, weekly supplement. This is uh, Sarah Netanyahu, the wife of the then prime minister and the today Prime Minister and the forever Prime Minister. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, Netanyahu appears as her nose trill there. And, um, and, and actually, my, my column was, uh, here's an, a thing that you don't remember well, and nobody remembers well. The column once, was once a month, not once a week, you know. So, uh, but people don't seem to remember that, because I hear it all the time that it was every week, you know. And uh, there was no way I could do those every week. Uh, I was asked before how long it takes. It, this took, took maybe three weeks to, to make. It's a lot of trial and error until slowly I arrived to the right uh, elements. So uh, I've worked in many, many, many magazines. And I've done everyone from Madonna to the Pope, from uh, Ahmadinejad to Kim Jong-il. from Marx to Madoff. So I cover all the spectrum. And uh, I've done some children books, uh, like My Dog is as Smelly as Dirty Socks, and What Presidents Are Made Of. And, um, and um, so, so talking about children books, I would like to tell you first a little bit how I arrived to draw in such a way. I was a, a kid in Uruguay. I was born in Uruguay. And I was smoking. <laughs> no, but I wore a tie as uh, all the Uruguayan students uh, since I was very, very young. And the first thing that I drew were cows. In Uruguay, there are many cows, and we eat them. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and they're horses and gauchos. But perhaps, um, I guess, I, I was the smallest in my family, the youngest kid. And I loved to draw faces. To, to, I, I guess I was looking. I was perceiving. I was constantly looking at people. And, um, and this is the oldest caricature I have. It's my fourth grade teacher. Um, and when I was 11, everything changed. We moved to Israel. So uh, I was looking at newspapers, and I was copying the way other caricatures uh, were, um, were drawing. Uh, I finished my army service. I actually studied in this campus for one year, computer science, for whatever reason. I, I, I was here for <laughs> one year uh, in 1987 until I realized that this wasn't for me. And I left and went to, I first applied to art school here, Bezalel in Jerusalem, and I wasn't accepted. And I uh, moved to New York. I arrived to New York in um, 1988, um, the days of uh, Donald Trump. And, um, and I was trying to perfect my, my drawing talents. I was trying, Ed Koch was the mayor back then. 
Uh, and I started studying uh, in the School of Visual Arts in New York. There was a caricature department there. But uh, I wasn't really very happy with my, with my drawing capacities. And um, this is what I was doing. But uh, at this time, Reagan was the president of the United States. And, and there was a, a great renaissance in, um, in caricature in America. Reagan really brought a lot of, uh, a lot of great artists. Suddenly, the magazines were filled with wonderful images. And, um, and I was very frustrated. I was very frustrated with my technical abilities. I felt like I had hit a wall. There was something I wanted to do, but I, my hand wasn't good enough. I felt like I saw things, but I couldn't make them. I couldn't describe them. And, um, and I started, um, I, I changed from the illustration department, from the caricature department to the graphic design department. And then looking at many, many different things, suddenly I came upon this poster, the poster of the movie The Great Dictator of Charlie Chaplin. And I was amazed by with what simplicity the artist managed to grasp the essence both of Charlie Chaplin and of, um, of Hitler with just a yellow paper cut with, with scissors. And I said to myself, you know, instead of uh, breaking my back trying to draw every line exactly, you know, maybe if I gra go for the big shapes, for the essence, I'll have a much easier time. And uh, it was the time of the first Gulf War, 1990. I was trying to draw Saddam Hussein. And, um, and, uh, and again, I was suffering. I was, I, I was really sweating on top of uh, all, the, all the shading, not very elegant. And, as, um, and I said, I'm going to try to do it with as little, as few lines as possible. Just grasp the essence of the icon, the visual icon of Saddam Hussein. And just as that um, artist did. And uh, as I was working on it, by total coincidence, I lived then with a girlfriend who was a heavy smoker. And there were cigarettes and um, matches all around the house. And I saw this... Uh, box of matches next to the illustration. And I decided to use it as the, as the mustache. So totally by coincidence, I used for the first time um, um, an object on an illustration. And um, so of course, um, Galit was talking before about, uh, about labels, about uh, the, the understanding versus, uh, I guess you use the word, the perceptual um, way of looking at something. So I think, in a way, the, the, the essence of my work is really to, to travel between those two uh, ways of looking at something, between defining and naming something, what it is, and why it is there, why the matches are there, what do I know about Saddam Hussein, versus the, the intuitive, the perceptual way of um, recognizing a face. Um, it is, in a way, the same thing that happens when we look at the famous head of a bull of Picasso, that we, we see something, but at the same time, we understand that we are seeing something that is not supposed to be there. And, um, and in a way, um, in, in other lectures that I, that I give about seeing, I talk a lot about uh, what is the essence of seeing. And, um, and there is a... There is a, um, a sentence, a quote, a definition of Paul Valéry that, uh, that says, basically, to see is to forget the name of that which we are looking at. OK? So I have it here. To see is to forget the name of the thing we are looking at. And in a way, it's really to trick our brain to forget the label. And um, I, I put this now just because I wanted to connect to what you were talking about, is to trick our brain to forget the, the label of something. And only then we can really experience it, perhaps, with cleaner eyes. So I think this is what happens to us when we are searching for faces. Uh, when we start seeing faces, in a way, we forget the label, the name of that which we are looking at. And, uh, and obviously, the nice thing about seeing faces is that it's a, it's a one-way road. Once our awareness expands, it will not shrink again. We will always see a face once we saw it for the first time. But, but um, uh, once I started working with objects, I realized that uh, there was somebody in the 40s, in the 30s in the States, uh, named Lou Hirschman, 
which uh, I only found two pictures of his work, and he worked for the magazine Look. So um, without knowing, somebody um, once somebody saw my work, they sent me um, this image. But uh, I started after I did that Saddam Hussein, that first Saddam Hussein. I started doing more uh, of those, and at that point, I realized. And I said to myself that I'm going to use the minimum, minimum objects needed and the minimum shapes needed to recognize the, 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 the person. I'm, I was going to try to really understand what is the visual essence and what is the conceptual essence of the person that I'm trying to define. And, and somehow throw that, that at you and see if, uh, if, you, if you get it. And um, so my first images were very, 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 very minimal. And um, I worked on it for, for hours, making pencil sketches, trying to really understand what is the visual essence of, uh, of a person, Rosanne. Yeah. Until, um, and at the same time, trying to find some kind of, uh, of comment about, uh, about the, the person, for example. So of course, uh, you know, th there is a use uh, of, um, of the big shapes and use of the small shapes and the relationship between the features and in this case, the very specific shape of the lips of, uh, of Barbara, I think, make, make a, big, uh, a big impact plus the small distance between her nose and her upper lip. And of course, it's due to the, to the huge nose. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, um, now what I realize intuitively, without thinking about it too much, is that the fact that I don't put all the uh, features actually helps you get the likeness better because you fill it in in your brain. As long, of course, as uh, it, it, that I made the big shape clear enough and I sent you to the right um, to the right way. But many times, what happens to me is that once I put the um, the small, the, the features, I actually ruin it. And, um, and it's more difficult to, to get the right eyes. And once I take it out, and, and I'll show you this in, in, in a little while. So that realization reminded me of a cartoon that I made um, when I just arrived to New York. I was studying some comics. So it's a, it's a little joke about the guy that draws faces on the I'm sorry, it might be a little bit sexist, but uh, I was very young back then. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's a guy that is uh, drawing, drawing uh, women, and, and I always have a trouble drawing women. Uh, they always get mad at me after I draw them. And um, because uh, apparently, I'm sorry? What, what? Oh, oh. Yeah, but as a caricaturist, we're not, you know, caricaturists don't strive for beauty. They strive for exaggeration. So most of the caricatures are not flattering. Um, anyway, so the idea was that uh, I kind of came up with the concept of drawing an empty face. And then everybody told me, it just looks like me. It looks exactly like me. And, and that's the idea. And then I became famous, of course. Everybody wanted me to, to draw them. But uh, in a way, without realizing, I came up with this uh, idea that when there are empty spaces, the brain fills it in in the way that, that suits, uh, that suits uh, the viewer. And, um, and if you don't know the work of William Orbach Liv Levy, uh, American caricaturist, I suggest that you look at it because he specialized in making very minimalistic uh, drawings of, uh, of famous people like uh, George Gershwin here. So. Um, so my first uh, jobs, as I said, I was again doing something very minimal. This appeared in the New Yorker in the, in the early 90s. And, um, and trying to understand what is, again, the visual essence. And, um, and in this case, um, and, and, and I think there are three things that I use to convey the person. Um, one is uh, really the... Um, the shape, understanding what is the, the, the visual uh, essence. The other one is, of course, the, the objects. And um, in this case, the object, I think, is not very obvious. Do you recognize this? Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, this was a comment about uh, me being bored by the Jay Leno show when it was uh, competing against uh, the Letterman show. Um, so I think, um, I think I try to use um, um, three things I was saying. One is the shape, the other one is the conceptual elements. Again, in this, in this uh, case, it's not that, that obvious. And the third one is really the, the colors. I, th I think that the colors help, send, help me send you to the right direction. I could confuse you if I would use the wrong colors. So, so I think uh, the combination of those three things help the recognition. Now, um, now if we get into, into distance, of course, uh, once I start putting facial features, then we get into the relationship between, between them. Um, you get this guy, right? So obviously, um, Rocky, Sylvester Stallone has the very heavy eyelids and the very, um, and somehow the, 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 the upper lip, I always perceived it, the, the mouth very close to the, to the eyes. Um, people that have very, near eyes to each other or very far. So George Bush is very famous, I think, George W. Bush, by, by having uh, eyes that are very near each other. Uh, although it might be also that we are used to the way he is caricatured, because we saw so many caricatures of him. So we usually he's represented that, that way. Um, Wayne Rooney, the soccer player, I mean, uh, most of the face is empty. Everything is in the, everything is in the center, you know? <laughs> and uh, on the other side, people that have a big gap between their eyes, just as Susan Sarandon, okay? She has sort of a lazy eye. Um, so I think that this is something that really helps uh, define her. And the most famous of all, Huge distance between the eyes. Jesse Jackson, of course. So, um, so when I drew Jesse Jackson, this is really one of the. This was sort of a breakthrough for me because I understood here that for the first time I, I understood that I was using additional things here. That um, the face, the head shape was very simple. It was just a circle. And what made it look like Jesse Jackson was really the relationship between these three, um, these three objects. Uh, I was in a way drawing with objects. By moving objects on, on, the sh on the face, I was, uh, I was um, drawing. And also, I'm using two things here that I didn't realize until then that uh, they were very helpful. And uh, I'm going to talk about it soon. But Galit talked about the body. I feel that the relationship between the head and the shoulders and the neck is very essential. And I think that in the case of Jesse Jackson, he has a very rigid, maybe it's not necessarily in this, uh, in this picture, but he has a very rigid and straight um, um, neck. And the other thing is the color. Um, the whiteness of his color helps us define the, him you know, is, is a visual icon that we are used to see him with a very white color, which is, of course, a contrast to his darker uh, skin tone. There's a striking similarity to Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so I tried, um, I played a little bit um, what will happen if, uh, if I would take the eyes away. So because I think that um, when we don't, as I said before, when we don't have all the information, we fill in the gaps. But what happens if the information, the wrong information is there? Does it deter us from, just like as in the picture of the two suspects of the bombing, something that deters us from realizing or deter the computer from, from realizing that these are the people? So does it look less like Jesse Jackson? I think it does, no? And of course, if it's there, it's not. And, and what if we have a nose, you know? Now it's totally, I think, not reminding us of Jesse Jackson. <laughs> so, uh, so I think in a way, this goes back to this is more Jesse Jackson than this, right? If somebody disagrees, tell me. 
<laughs> and, um, and of course, once the eyes are in the right place, it really becomes much more Jesse uh, Jackson. So uh, bringing the filling the gaps to an extreme is this one, where there is no head, no face. So I'm using the colors, I'm using the body, I'm using the context, of course, to, to give you uh, all the clues of who the person, the person is. So um, I remember my caricature teacher, uh, a New Yorker, saying, well, when, we, when you say, I, I can't do a, a New Yorker accent, but uh, he, he had a good New Yorker accent, believe me. Uh, so he said, when you want to meet somebody on 23rd and 2nd, and you are on 23rd and 3rd, you recognize them from a block away. And you know that's the person you are waiting to meet, even though you cannot see the shape of their eyes, you cannot see the shape of their nose, you only see the big, the big shapes. And I think this is a bit what uh, happens when we see soccer players, when we are in a, in a soccer or any other sport, that uh, we use the body to help us understand who the people, the people are. Of course, we have also the numbers, but I think we, we, um, the bodies here are very helpful to, for us to realize who the soccer players uh, are. So um, talking about the relationship between head and body and shoulders and gesture, um, Larry King, very specific way that he holds his body. And, um, and of course, also the, the Schleike, so however they are called. Um, um, another rigid guy, um, <laughs> <laughs> Prince, Prince Charles. And of course, in some cases, the body is uh, what really helps uh, describe, who um, helps us define the person. Um, now, talking about the relationship between head and shoulders. So, uh, Mr. Bashar al-Assad has a very, very thick neck, very, you know, he's like a goose in a way, you know, um, very, very rigid. And in general, that family, you'll soon see his father, they have issues between head and neck and shoulders, you know. Um, they are the people that are the, the, cons the constrained ones, you know, maybe I'm a little bit like, like this, like uh, McCain, you know, very intense, ready to jump, you know, or Angela Merkel, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and I think this is a great uh, sample, the, the big head, tiny body for Ross Perot. And... Um, And this is the father of Bashar al-Assad, where basically his neck comes from here, like this, you know? I mean, th there are many people that, that, that you know, President Weizmann, as a Weizmann, if you remember, also his neck came from, from here when he was, when he was older. Um, oh, and uh, Bob Dole, of course, you know? Uh, white pineapple. Oh, the Dole pineapple. Okay, sorry, I missed it. You know, I went for the bitterness of the lemon in, in, instead. <laughs> and, uh, and another guy where um, the head is stuck uh, between low in the shoulders is, uh, is uh, Nixon. Of course, there is a big, uh, big gesture um, here, very typical gesture that, uh, that I use. Um, now, talking about colors, again, I feel that um, the whiteness of the hair of Yeltsin really helps me send you to that direction. It's probably more white than what it is in reality, but it is a visual icon that gives, gives a clue. The same with uh, Einstein. I, it was very important for me that the shape, the face, the, the skin tone couldn't be white, so that the whiteness of the hair and the mustache would be clear. Um, the smile of JFK. Also, a very strong, in general, I think I look, uh, I think tone, we're not going to see black and white pictures here, but, but tone and color on the face, uh, I look usually for what's the whitest thing and what's the darkest uh, thing. And, and, and there are some faces that have much more, much stronger contrast between darks and lights, and there are faces that are, and, 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 and that are much more the, the, in mid-tones, and I think this helps recognition also. Uh, black and white, that's one with a lot of contrast. 
And, uh, and moving on to a pink guy. So um, we have uh, George Washington. So um, so basically, um, after working many years in um, in um, in magazines, in the later in the lately I've been working less in magazines. I actually have a, a couple of TV programs. Uh, I did one in Spain and. Uh, a TV program here for very young kids in the Hop channel, Luli, and, uh, which is not necessarily about making faces. And, uh, and now I have a program on the educational TV, in um, the Israeli educational TV. So um, we are working now on the second season. And in the second season, we uh, illustrate, I illustrate uh, very traditional Israeli songs. So, um, so I want to show you one of the chapters that is still not out. Um, and you'll see who I'm illustrating. So this is the, I'm going to show you first the opening of the program, which is called Sadna Workshop. And, um, and the song that I'm illustrating, which is not the song you're going to hear, is Beshel Tapuach, uh, the Bialik song, Because of an Apple. So uh, this is the opening. <laughs> So you'll see now the process of building a face and see how slowly I improve or maybe I don't improve the likeness of somebody. So just to end, a couple of things about um, in, in, uh, after I created a couple of uh, children books, suddenly I started to be invited to kindergartens and to work with children. And then I realized that uh, this whole uh, way of working that I created it just to avoid being discovered as somebody who cannot draw very well uh, <laughs> was really so easy for everybody else to work this way. 
And kids started to send me very uh, innocent pictures, uh, or some less innocent. This 12-year-old um, <laughs> this girl sent me a picture of Monica Lewinsky uh, with a letter saying, you know, and I put the stain also, you know, <laughs> talking about labels, you know, <laughs> about con conceptual or cognitive uh, help. And um, so, um, so I started to create, uh, to do workshops with, uh, with children. And I saw how uh, easy actually it was for some kids to come up with, uh, with likenesses of, uh, of themselves. Uh, yeah, of self-portraits, of course, yes. And, uh, and slowly I started to work also with adults. And I saw that uh, for adults it, was, uh, it could be also quite uh, easy. Um, I worked also with cancer patients, and this is where the objects really became a non-verbal language to, to do some introspection and to talk about things that could be difficult to say in, in words. So, um, so the last thing I want to show you is an exhibition that I had a couple of years ago in the Tel Aviv Museum, the Beit HaTfutzot Museum, the Museum of the Jewish People. It was, it was called Family Matters. And my idea was to create a huge pixelized picture. So uh, I'll explain what I mean. It was the idea to create uh, a crowdsource installation. So I started to um, explore pixelized uh, pictures. And um, can you recognize this image? It's a Camp David uh, agreement. So I started to play a little bit with uh, with uh, defining things with very um, minimal information. And uh, it brought me, of course, to Facebook. And um, the interesting thing about the Facebook uh, icons, that uh, there are 160 pixels by 160 pixels. In this case, the, the face of Bruce Springsteen is only 52 by 73 pixels. And of course, we recognize uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, my Bruce Springsteen looks like, um, lo looks <laughs> like this. But, um, uh, but I started to play with, uh, with trying to, under, to use the minimal pixel information. Um, and, um, and, and I realized that uh, Andy Warhol, in a way, was, uh, was a master of this uh, understanding of, of an icon. I wonder if it's my phone. No, it's not my phone. I don't know, but I'm not going to answer. And uh, um, so the, the, the exhibition that, uh, that we did, I asked different families to make a self-portrait or to describe themselves using objects. So some families made uh, one, one face, one, one figure that described everyone. Some other families did um, their house or some fought. And the only thing they, they argued, the only thing they agreed about was their family pet. And, um, and my pictures, my idea was to create three pixelized pictures. The first one is Moses with the tablets. The second one, Ben Gurion this, um, um, declaring the independence of Israel. The third one was a picture of a kid flying in the air. It was actually a picture of my father throwing my cousin in the air in Uruguay in the 50s. And the idea was to have uh, 2,960, I think, uh, pixels, each one filled with the picture of one family. So, um, and it was a, a 12 meter by 3 meter mural. And slowly, um, we started to photograph the collages uh, and index them. Uh, Indigo HP, they printed them all for us. So, slowly, we put them all together. And after 2,000, and 960, I think, we got uh, the whole mural uh, completed. So, um, so this was for me kind of uh, putting together everything that, uh, that I do, the teaching, the, the, the creating. Um, and Galit mentioned my, um, my app, if you want to make faces yourself. So faces I make, um, you can do stuff digitally on the iPad. And uh, so these are some of the ones that I uh, created on the uh, iPad. And this was done by my wife, who draws much better than me, as, uh, as I said. So uh, if you want to see more information, pivenwall.com is my website. And if you want to write me 
Uh, my email is there, hanoch at pivenworld.com. So uh, I spoke three minutes more than what you told me. Uh, and, uh, and if there are any questions, I would love to answer. Mm -hmm. Yes. I actually have more than one question. Okay. My first question is, since you have something in mind when you start, yeah. do you know when you've got it good enough or do you need feedback? Um, I used to need a lot of feedback. And as I grow older and uh, have more experience, I, I need less. Uh, but I also found ways to, um, to, to trick myself constantly. Because I get used to seeing it in one way. And I'm sure you all know this. When we see something in one way, we need to trick ourselves. So sometimes I use a mirror and look at, uh, you know, through the mirror. Um, I photograph it and then look at it on the screen, look at it uh, through the camera. Creating a filter helps me objectify it. Going away, uh, st working standing up and not sitting, constantly changing angles help me see something from different. Uh, and getting a, 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 a away from it and coming back. Um, you know, after a while. Um, and I always, um, I start with lots of objects and I bring them in and out, in and out constantly. And I glue always at the end. So, and usually I glue when the deadline is there, you know, and I don't have any more, you know. And sometimes at the photographer uh, studio, I'm moving, you know, I'm moving something. And uh, so it's a constant move until. And then I do some change in Photoshop, you know. So, <laughs> yes. Yes. No, I mean my. I well, I think you know. Um, my idea is to have some objects that help you realize who the person is. And have t some objects that bring up something, um, something surprising, a point of view, um, such as the Aladdin lamp of Obama, the broom of the wife of the prime minister. Um, I mean, many times the objects that I choose, the material, the sausage for Yeltsin, the you know the marshmallows for Clinton. Actually, I didn't have it, but uh, um, are. Uh, because of uh, a point of view, which is, it, it is not the first thing you would think about that person, but it's a, it, it's sort of a puzzle. Um, I look at it. I look. Yes, with meat. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I use uh, in a way. I, I look at it like as if I'm creating a puzzle, and there are some clues there that are informative. And their, their task is to send you to the right direction, like the American flags for Obama, obviously. And some objects are there to, to surprise you or to, to give you this, that aha moment or to open something. Yes? Surround. And videos, and I stop videos, and I move it a little bit more, and yeah, lots. Of, and, and from some picture, I would get the eye, and from another picture, I would get the profile, and from another picture, you know. And the pictures that I put today, um, I specifically chose pictures that would look like, you know, kind of like my. Uh, they were, you know, those weren't the pictures I worked from 20 years ago, 10 years ago when I when I did those. Okay. Okay. Not that, but what I did experience is this. When I work with kids that are perhaps uh, less than two years old, I mean, kids start drawing faces when they're around two years old. Would you agree, more or less? That's my experience. And I see kids that they cannot draw a face with a pencil, but if you give them buttons and a circle, they could make a face. And they would say eyes, nose, mouth. So that, to me, is an, kind of an interesting. So it's uh, more about the, motor. the motor skill, perhaps, is more difficult. But just putting, it, there is the recognition. And in a way, this is kind of uh, symbolic to the fact that 
we can all create art except that we have a technical limitation, you know? So maybe this, there is something there. I mean, I was more talking about the concept, and one thing that struck me, and, and you explained that very well, is in the Archibald painting, yeah. so indeed the, the young children, sometimes they don't see the face, they see the elements, but there's a big difference with what you do, is you, you don't use a lot of elements. Right. Right. So I'm wondering if what we observe right. And is it a fact with uh, what you're saying that children won't see the the total well, thing? Yeah, so, but we always, I mean, I, I, I believe that it was because they couldn't get the gesture to give them the, the gestalt. But I think it's not true. Now mm -hmm. that I see your, uh, your images, it's because of crowding. It's probably because of crowding. And there is no crowding. In your case, because you don't use a lot of elements. You right. Know, well, one, one thing I can tell you, maybe it's connected to that, that when I show the pictures of found faces and I tell the kids, now I'm going to give you homework and your homework is to find faces. And then immediately, usually within five seconds or ten seconds, somebody says, I see a face and they immediately start seeing faces. So maybe, I, I mean, in that case, they do see the gestalt, but, but usually to see a face, you just need three elements. As you were saying, it's not, it's not crowded. So I, I haven't experienced that the kids have a hard time with the gestalt. Yes? I did some. I did. I started with a self-portrait. I don't know um, if you if you saw it. Um, I did one for the TV program. I, I've done some, uh, of course. How can I be objective, you know? <laughs> and, and, and actually when I, you know, I think a caricaturist, I was talking before about the nastiness of the, the caricaturist as a young man, you know, making fun of women. And, um, and, uh, and you know, when you, a caricature has bad reputation. A, you know, the word caricature has bad reputation. It's, it's simplifying something, it's flattening something. And, and usually, I, you know, caricaturists are usually perceived as, um, the, the caricatures can be nasty. I, most of the caricaturists that I know are not nasty people, but uh, that's their way of doing something nasty that they don't allow themselves to, to do in real life. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, once I did a self-portrait, I, I kind of saw it from the other side and I said, you know, how can I simplify myself to just two objects? You know, I'm so complex, you know, there's so much about me, you know, so, so I just threw everything in, you know. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, it is, um, you know, a caricature is, um, there is no, in a caricature there is no, well, from the other side, you, you know, on the other side there is no, the two sides of an argument. Yes, I, I think. The, the one that has two hands. Yeah, the one that they always do a dancer now, with it. I remember once a friend of mine looking at it and saying, such hairy armpits. Now, anybody who knows the corks will know it. When it my question is, do you have any idea whether Alessi <laughs> intended this to be a person with arms? I would imagine, I, I would imagine that no, I, I would imagine that no, I, I think about something similar because there's so many faces that we see. Of course, sometimes you see a bag for children and, and, or, or some tool for children and you say, well, the, the designer probably made a face. You put those two screws here on purpose to create a face. But I think uh, that many faces are constantly happen randomly, uh, probably because uh, we are constantly looking for technologically, engineeringly for symmetry. And uh, so there are two eyes. And once there are two eyes, anything that you see under will immediately be seen as the nose or the mouth, you know? All right? Okay. Yes? <laughs> Right. Right. Uh, but you can recognize faces so well and not have the eyes. And also, we know that when we look at faces, the eyes are the first thing that we uh, fixate our right. eyes on. Right. Not having the eyes and still being. Yeah. 
I think, you know, we were talking about it with Galit, that, 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 that I, I don't think I can have a right answer to saying you only need the big shapes and you can avoid the small shapes, I, because uh, I think it's a combination and, and, and I think, you know, there is obviously uh, different scenarios. But now, I, many times when I work, I start just with, um, with, with objects ignoring the, the contour. And I just, you know, as you were doing in some of the samples that you isolate, the George Clooney, and the, um, you just isolate the, the, the features, you know, um, which I think is very difficult to, to recognize faces like this, in my opinion, uh, when you isolate from the big forms. So, but now I start with that, and then I might perceive that it's looking, and then the big challenge is just like in the Wayne Rooney, how those three shapes live in the in the sea of the of the shape of the of the face. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>